other values, then they have no, no, no leg to stand on. I'm not going to give anybody any ammunition. I'm sorry, I just came in late to this. Who Hello. are you? Robert, Robert Spencer. Spencer. Uh -huh. I write about Islam and Jihad. He's written many books on Islam. And, uh -huh. you know, been, how long has this been a focus of your attention? Uh, well, pro publicly since 9-11. Uh, uh, but privately I was consulting for several groups about these issues in the 90s. In the 80s? In the 90s. In the 90s. And I first uh, started studying Islam and read the Quran and so on in the early 80s. Though. How about Arabic? Do you read Arabic? Yeah, um, it could be better, but I do read it to some degree. Right. I wouldn't say it's fluent. Can you think of an example of any country that's become more Muslim and more free? And more free? Yeah. No, that's never happened. Islamic law is not free. Islamic law does not uphold basic values that we consider to be uh, uh, core principles of human rights. And so there is no country that adopts Islamic law in its fullness that upholds those rights. It never has happened. Now the American ethos is that we never down any religion. Is, am I correct in that kind yeah, of? Yeah, and uh, that's all for. Uh, I'm all for that. But there are restrictions that have been placed on religious practice, uh, quite rightly, like the outlawing of polygamy that is uh, that was part of the Mormon Church, uh, and there is a state, a political aspect to Islam that is not purely religious. And it seems to me that this is a distinction that's going to have to be drawn sooner or later in American law, that people are perfectly free to uh, practice the Islamic faith as an individual religious faith, but when they start to assert its political and supremacist aspects that are in contradiction to the U.S. Constitution, then we have to resist that. How big a problem are honor killings, say, in the United States? It's a growing problem. Uh, there have been numerous honor killings in the United States, and there's more and more, there are more and more all the time. Uh, there, uh, there was one in uh, Detroit, in the Detroit area, in the Je Jessica Mokdad case that we named our conference on honor killing in April. Uh, after Jessica looked dead. Uh, there was a Nora Amaliki in uh, Phoenix who was run over by her father uh, in a car because uh, she was not living the Muslim lifestyle. Uh, Jessica Mokdad was murdered for not wearing the hijab, just like Aksa Parvez in uh, Mississauga, Ontario. Also the Said sisters in, in Dallas area, or Irving, Texas, who were murdered by their father for uh, having non-Muslim boyfriends. Um, there, was, uh, there, there have been several others. There was a lady in Georgia, there was another lady in Florida, and so on. And the problem is, is that every time these things happen, uh, the news stories say, well, honor killing has nothing to do with Islam. And actually, honor killing is something that is allowed for in Islam. 91% of honor murders take place among Muslims. And the uh, states of Jordan, of Syria, of Iraq, as well as the Palestinian Authority, have lesser penalties for honor murders. And Islamic clerics have resisted any change to that on Islamic grounds. Islamic law stipulates no penalty for a father who kills a child. And so to say that uh, that there's nothing to do with it, that, that Islam has nothing to do with it when there are honor murders is only to make for the situation where more of these murders are likely to happen because we are not dealing with the problem at its root. And until we challenge the Muslim community to, 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 to teach against and fight against the core assumptions that lead to honor killing, there are only going to be more in the West and in the United States. And uh, as well as justify suicide attacks and uh, all kinds of things of this nature, um, and he's the leading Islamic cleric in the world. He's, he's on uh, 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 Al Jazeera, and he has numerous books. He's, he's extraordinarily famous and renowned. He's also the spiritual leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, and returned to Egypt after having been barred there for 50 years, just uh, last year. Um, some of the leading Islamic clerics in the world uh, are generally, I mean, the leading Islamic clerics in the world are generally all on the other side. Uh, the problem is, is that Islam does teach warfare against unbelievers and hatred of Jews and Islamic supremacism and so on, and so death for apostasy and so on. And so if you're going to become a cleric, you're, you're generally going to buy these things. And if you're going to become a leading cleric, then you're going to hold them even more fervently or more eloquently or more uh, effectively.
collectively than your peers. So the leading Islamic clerics in the world are not the voices of reason or Or, uh, well, you can even, well, anyway, that's another question. The, the, the thing, Ibn Taymiyyah is a leading Islamic jurist and thinker who was much admired of Osama bin Laden because of his ferocity in teaching the necessity to wage war on religious grounds against non-Muslims. And that's the name of the mosque. And it's telling that they do not translate that part into English on the sign, so that nobody who knows, unless you know how to read Arabic, nobody's going to see that Ibn Taymiyyah is on the sign at all. Because that might raise alarm bells for people who are informed. But Islamic Center of Los Angeles sounds perfectly benign. Yeah. Sorry, I'll just one quick and then I'll stop. Um, Dennis Prager says that there are lots of moderate Muslims who wish no ill, but they have no power or influence in that's Muslim quite, lives. That's quite right, and that's right because Islam does teach, all the sects and schools of Islamic jurisprudence teach warfare against unbelievers and hatred of Jews and subjugation of the non-Muslims under the rule of Islamic law. These things are not taught by a tiny minority of extremists. These things are taught by all the schools of Sunni and Shiite Islamic jurisprudence, and all the sects of Islam that are recognized as mainstream. The sects of Islam that do not teach these kinds of things, like the Ahmad Ahmadiyya, are persecuted precisely because they reject these things. And so there are plenty of Muslims who have no interest in doing anything but just having a peaceful life and having a job and raising their families and so on. But they don't have they, they don't speak out because they know they don't have any leg to stand on theologically or, or jur juridically within Islamic law. Have you made efforts Where? to encourage those parts of Islam to speak up? Well, the, the people have been encouraging them to speak up for 10 years, and we don't have anything. You know, you would think that if the if the vast majority of Muslims actually disapproved of uh, the jihad that is being waged against the West today, then we would see huge organizations, not just an individual here and an individual there, but huge organizations of Muslims who were dedicated to uh, fighting against these at these attitudes and beliefs within their own community. And we don't see that. And that's a, a, an indication of the fact that they know that, 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 that they do not have a foundation within traditional... Let me ask Islam you law. something. Where are you based? I don't say that because I have so many death threats. I don't generally reveal that. Well, publicly. I want to ask you something. Would you be willing to have a debate with Reza Aslan about everything that you've yeah, been saying? Yeah, I'll debate Reza Aslan. He won't debate me. He won't debate you? Yeah. How does, one get a, you. how does one get in touch with you? Uh, Robert yeah. Spencer, just Google him. You'll find his contact information. He has contact information? Yeah. Right, yeah. Please say, please say that you will debate him on this. Oh, I'd be happy to debate Reza Aslan. Reza Aslan fears to debate me because he knows that I'm onto him. He knows that I know the truth about his support for Hamas, Hezbollah, the Muslim Brotherhood, and the Islamic Republic of Iran. And he knows that I've got the goods on it, and that I've published it at Jihad Watch, and he knows he has no response. And so the only thing he will respond to you with is scorn. But the scorn is hollow and empty because I have the facts. Thank you. And I will debate him anytime. If you bring him up right now, I'll debate him. Thank you.